It's finally happening. This is the video we've all been waiting for. The Fujifilm X-H2S versus the Blackmagic 6K Pro and the B-Raw comparison test, or just the comparison in general. That's what we're going to be talking about today. Can the Fujifilm X-H2S go toe-to-toe -to -toe with external B-Raw versus the internal B-Raw of the 6K Pro? We're going to be looking at the image. We're going to be looking at uh, the benefits, the workflow, um, what are the cons, all those things. So stay tuned because I'm excited and I hope you're excited. Also, if you do want to check out the footage for yourself, I will provide a link in the description so you can download and see what you like and what you don't like. All right, let's go. So as you saw in the beginning of this video, there are a couple of clips that are labeled A and B. Go ahead and give your answer to which camera you think it is in the comments and see if you guess it right. It's, you, probably, you probably already figured it out, but let me know in the comments below. Couple of things to get this going, you have to update your X-H2S to the new 2.0 firmware update that Fuji released earlier, I believe this month. And make sure this is uh, the monitor is on 3.8, and that's going to allow this two systems to work with the B-Raw. So there are two resolution outputs from the XH2S to the Video Assist 12G: 6.2K open gate, so the full height and width of the sensor, and 4.8K 16x9 DCI, up to 30 frames for both. Now I like to film in constant bitrate, so that is 3 to 1, 5 to 1, 8 to 1, and 12 to 1 compressions. Now the 6K Pro has a clear advantage when it comes to resolutions. Um, you have 6K, 6K 24 to 1, 5.7K, 4K, 2.8K, and 1080p. That's a big difference, I think, in terms of resolution. Now obviously having 6.2K, you can crop in to get your other resolutions if you need to. Um, that's the idea of the open gate anyway. You can just recrop and reframe and still have a lot of detail and everything. But you don't have a lot of options like you have in a Blackmagic Pocket 6K Pro. So take note of that. The base ISO is only 1000. The ISO when it comes to the B-Roll and everything here, you don't treat it like F-Log 2, which is the native is uh, 1250, or F-Log uh, 1, which is 640. You don't treat this... ISO like those two. This is kind of subjective in the way. You still have full control of the ISO in B-Roll in your editor. All right, so I misspoke about the ISO capabilities. You still have full control of the ISO in B-Roll in your editor. So apparently you can't change your ISO once you select it in camera and it records to the recorder. As you can see here, it's grayed out. I cannot change the ISO 1000 to any other ISO if I wanted to boost that gain. And that's kind of sucks. Cause now it doesn't really feel like B-Roll. Now, now granted, I can still put all the LUTs that work with B-Roll and it can still work with it. But in terms of like changing your exposure and stuff, you still have all that flexibility. You still have 12 bit. So that's just one thing that just can't happen with it. So just keep that in mind moving forward, I guess. You can still change your white balance when you are uh, in your editor, but you can't change ISO. And this doesn't bother me at all, just because um, I normally shoot higher ISOs or I leave the ISO pretty high anyway, around 800 and 1000, just because it retains a bit more highlight information most of the time. Yes, you sacrifice a little bit more digital noise. Um, that's why you have that dual ISO uh, when you drop it down. Come to mind, I don't think I've even tested out the dual native ISO, if this actually has it. I'll be right back. I reached out to some of my friends who have a beautiful studio space. 
and I made a quick concept inspired by the fall season. So enjoy this mini profile of my model, Tierra. My mom, she used to always take pictures of me and my brother when we were younger. That would made me comfortable being in front of the camera. She used to dress me up all the time, and you know, they're from the city, so you know, in the city, I became very versatile with the way I dress. I like trying different things, different hairstyles, and so far I've pulled off all of them. So, <laughs> modeling expresses who I am. I feel like I'm the black sheep of the world. All right, so let's dive right into a quick dynamic range comparison, as well as f 2 and ProRes versus B-Raw, and how does it handle skin tone for either of them? Take note, this was filmed in mixed lighting, so daylight, and I had a 300X off to the side uh, with the lantern, which I was using as a wrap for the lighting. So as you see here, I exposed for my model. Take note how much detail is retained in the window. Both cameras were set at 1000 ISO, and as you can clearly see here, the 6K Pro holds way more detail in the highlights. Now the external B-Roll clips fairly quickly. But if you do turn on highlight recovery, it does save some information. But there is still a flat line. So this tells me that you should try to underexpose and save your highlights if you're dealing with any bright light sources and you try to retain. Now obviously you, wanna, you don't always want to have everything perfectly exposed, it's hard to do that, especially with different lighting scenarios. Now obviously I didn't do any low light tests, but just keep note, since there's no dual gain ISO when you have the external B-roll, um, you will run into more noise pattern. And I mean, that's the nature of raw anyway, You're, it's gonna have more noise that so you have to kind of clean up on the back end, again, which gives you more flexibility so that the camera isn't doing all that processing in the camera. So just keep note of that as well. Now the tools coming out of the video sys are really great. You have histogram, you have false color, and you have waveform. So this is gonna help you expose properly for those highlights um, when you need to. Now I am no colorist by any means. Uh, so what I did for this particular test, I shot them as closely as possible. Note that the X-H2S has the metal bone speed booster on it, so you have a little bit more shallow depth of field, but it doesn't affect, it doesn't affect any of the color. So with F-Log2, I love using the Let Co LUTs. So this is just a natural um, Rex 09 LUT and then some tweaks to the white balance and contrast. And then for my 6K Pro, I love using Dehancer. And Dehancer has a really great, I think great, uh, Rex 709 a conversion LUT um, built into the plugin. So that's what I did here. And then I just kind of matched them both. For me, I think the 6K Pro is a bit warmer in the highlights and midtones, um, but it's easy to match both of these if you want to go ahead and match them. Personally, after using both cameras on several projects and mixing F-Log2 and B-Roll, it's better to pick one or the other systems, uh, for those who are wondering. Because color management can get really tricky when you have two different color profiles, uh, so dealing with RAW and dealing with ProRes, but like it's F-Log2, so to avoid headaches in the editing especially if you're not confident in color grading and matching and stuff I would I wouldn't recommend trying to shoot both of these with those who have the X-H2S and a Blackmagic camera it's better to either get the video assist pro so you can have both b-roll capabilities or just stick to one system now when it comes to recording I have with me only a few I have like a couple 128 uh, gigabyte SD cards from Angelbird this is the v90 cards now um, when it comes to recording time, uh, if you're in 6.2K open gate, you have only six minutes um, when recording three to one compression. And then if you're going opposite end on that of 12 to one, you have about, I believe, 26 minutes on 6.2 open gate. Yeah, not a lot, so you definitely need a much bigger car and a faster car. But if you're going to the 4.8K DCI, you have about uh, 13 minutes on three to one compression and 52 minutes with 12 to one compression. Again, this is on a 128 gigabyte uh, V90 SD card.
So I worked up the courage to film a 20 minute interview with the X-H2S. And um, this was part of the project I did when I flew out to Israel earlier this year. Uh, we're just still wrapping up a little bit of these interviews. So just recording with the X-H2S and the B-Roll to the external monitor so I can have these clips match the workflow um, that I have of my 6K Pro, which I shot everything with up to this point. I use my Metal Bones Locking EF adapter, so it gives me a, a full frame equivalent uh, with the DZO 21mm uh, Vespit Prime at T2.8. Lighting I use is my 300X from Aperture and the Dome 2 with a grid. This is nothing groundbreaking in terms of lighting. It was very simple, uh, but the content is going to be repurposed for online content. So, it's, so I had my subject center frame for the most part because I, I know we're going to be cutting around that with like Instagram reels and whatnot. I had to be honest, I do worry about using mirrorless cameras for long form interviews, uh, sort of like this situation here where a more traditional A camera would. I consider the Blackmagic 6K Pro a little bit more traditional because of all the things that it offers. I say that because as a solo filmmaker, there's a lot of variables that you have to consider with a mirrorless system and that also introduces more points of failure. Now yes, the image is more than capable of capturing all the details you ever want, but it's the intangibles as we say in sports, right? Sports lingos, like what are the things that make this particular system worthwhile and less headache moving into? So for me, a lot of issues that mirrorless cameras have are battery life, recording limits, and then dealing with audio, with external audio. Again, if you're a solo filmmaker, uh, you. For me, I want to always have things packaged as nice and neat as possible so I can have less variables, so I, have to worry, so I can have worry about more about the content that I'm trying to make rather than the gear. Now, the X-H2S does alleviate a lot of these issues for most mirrorless cameras compared to most mirrorless cameras, that is. Uh, one, because it has no record limit. Uh, it's only limited by the card that you have in there. And it, and it can film in ProRes or external raw codecs like we've been talking about so far. Now I do use the Unified Accessory Pro Kit from Wooden Camera, that is the case system that I use. Some of you all have been asking about it. There will be a video about the whole case system coming after this video, but I use that because in that kit, it comes with a dummy battery. And so I use that dummy battery to detap um, so I can have my Anton Bowers power the whole system. Now obviously not everybody has this capability, but that does alleviate some of the stress when dealing with long form content like interviews. But that being said, Again, I still prefer my 6K Pro for a lot of the bigger, uh, a lot of the heavy lifting when it comes to video, especially long form content, because one, it has uh, pretty good preamps and I can just use my adapter to get full XLR. I can have the audio married to the uh, file when I'm recording. That's what I did a lot when I was out shooting a documentary. Uh, also, there's just a lot of less points of, con uh, a lot, there's, less stress with this. The only thing you have to really worry about is battery if you don't have a D-tap or for a bigger battery, but that's probably the only issue and I solved that issue with the battery stuff that I have. So, yeah, I just is this a better system internal NDs? Is this more ready and it's more ready to go than trying to set up a mirrorless camera? You can do both obviously, but that's my preference. I know somebody asked that if I picked the XH2S over the 6K. No the X-H2S is still my everyday content creation camera, but it's not my heavy lifter camera. But I'm glad I did this this little experiment just to see, yeah. Now, you might ask yourself, what are the benefits of using the Video Assist with the Fujifilm X-H2S, especially if you, if you own this camera as well? Well, here's where I like to think about it. Um, not just the B-Raw capabilities, but the fact that the X-H2S, just like the Lumix um, and also Z-Cam, they have the ability to go two different routes with raw codecs now, as well as introducing ProRes. So if you're in the ecosystem of Final Cut Pro and, and Premiere Pro, you have ProRes raw there. Uh, if you just wanna use ProRes, this is fantastic as internally, it's a much more wide range codec, universal codec that um, all editors accept. And then you have B-Raw. B-Raw is going to be for those who use DaVinci Resolve like myself. Now, there's no bottlenecking with this camera. You have unlimited capabilities as well as, well, I won't say unlimited, but you have more capabilities than most cameras on the market for this aspect of flexibility. Now, how often are you gonna be switching between all three of those? Probably not often you're gonna to stick to one um, particular route of editing workflow, 
but you have the options. There's no excuse to say, oh, I don't have this camera because it doesn't do this. This camera is a jack of all trades and slightly master of some. So um, that's definitely something to think about when you're thinking about external recording. How does that fit with other cameras you might own? Like if you have an Ursa or you have, you know, this, that, and the other. So that's how I like to think about it. And just a side note, B-Roll is more superior, I think, than ProRes Raw. I can't stand ProRes Raw. It's, it's super limiting. I don't see the benefits from it. And it sounds like I'm bashing it. There's plenty of people who use it, and that's fantastic. It's just not for me. That's not the codec that I like. B-Roll just gives so much flexibility, and there's so much uh, information there that you can really manipulate um, to your liking uh, or whatever the project calls for. So I just wanted to throw that out there. Now, the user experience when filming with the monitor and the camera itself, uh, let's just start with the size and weight. Uh, obviously, this is pretty standard how you would set up your monitor. You have it on your top handle, what have you. Um, for me, going back to this sort of DSLR, um, not DSLR, but this sort of hybrid mirrorless setup um, was a little uh, uh, unnatural, I guess you can say, even though the Blackmagic is that style, but I'll get to that in a second. But as you can see here, I do have, I, I don't film with native lenses. And so I have these, you know, bigger cinema lenses, you know, this is the DZO Vespit Primes. These are quite compact, but it's very heavy. So I know I'm talking very fast. I'm trying to get through this, this bit here. As you can see, it's, it's very uh, front heavy. Now, obviously I can put my rails and kind of balance it out and have it, you know, fully kitted out. But if you're just going something like this, and if you worry about weight, this is pretty a, a very front heavy setup. This monitor is not light at all, um, but it feels really nice and really robust, like it would take a beating. But yeah, that's something I just wanna say. Now, if I bring in my Pocket 6K, it doesn't have a monitor, but it feels way, way better. I almost dropped it. It feels way better in the hands in terms of weight. Like it's actually more balanced than anything, so. If that matters, that matters to me. Um, and of course, if I had a monitor, I can have a much more lighter monitor and it's not gonna really tip for it. Sure, translate into which language? What, Siri, I wasn't not talking to you. I didn't even say anything that refers to Siri. What the heck? Guys, I got the, I got the Ultra. I actually freaking love this watch. Okay, back to what I was saying. This feels way more balanced in the hands, I think. Uh, it is heavier, it's a lot heavier compared to this, but is this, you know, after a long day of filming, you want something that's not gonna break your wrist. That's how I see it. So one thing that I've noticed with a lot of monitors, when you turn it on, it takes a while for all the monitors to turn on. So if you didn't notice, this is the button to turn on the monitor. As soon as you press it, you hear the fans turn on and it just turns on. Like, thank you. I don't have to wait or, or wonder if it's turning on or did I press it long enough? Like, I don't have to worry about that, so. Nice little, nice little touch there. Now the other aspect is actually dealing with these two different systems. Like I was touching on earlier, there's some controls that you have here in the monitor. So you set mainly just for the B-roll and recording capabilities. But um, there's a disconnect of how this communicates to this. And rightly so, there's no really camera control. And I think that's what's missing from this whole package. Like camera control will be fantastic. Um, and like I was saying earlier, you know, your ISO has to be set on the camera. Your white balance has to be set on the camera. Um, the cool thing I just actually realized that you can have autofocus with B-roll now. That's kind of insane, right? Um, but anyway, that doesn't matter. Uh, it does matter for some people, I guess. But um, anything else re re relating to B-roll is controlled here. Uh, and I wish there was more camera control features that will make life a little bit easier instead of kind of bouncing in between. So the best practice I think is just to set up how you want this camera to be and you can, and then once it's set, don't touch it. You don't need to touch it in my opinion and just worry about what's happening up here. So your exposure, um, some other, you know, compositional tools, things like that. So I was just worried about that. Now, what are some of the drawbacks? Yeah, I have a couple of them. And again, this is just the first iteration of this firmware update. So I hope there's gonna be st uh, stability improvement moving forward and things like that. And that's actually the first thing, stability improvement. There were times where uh, communication between the camera and the monitor just stopped. Um, and it picked up, it stopped and then picked up recording. So as you can see here, as this clip is playing, it just says 
media lost. And I was like, oh, that's weird. I don't know why I did that. Now, it could be my uh, SD card and the speed of it. Again, I was at eight to one compression for most of the time, um, but because uh, I, I needed that space or 12 to one that is. Obviously, yes, you can use USB-C um, to record to a SSD externally. I personally don't recommend that. That's just another fail safe. I don't like having a cord, and especially the way that it's positioned is at the bottom of this monitor. There's no practical way of attaching, attaching that SSD to your rig. I wish there was a way to really utilize the fact that I have a CFAS Express card on this camera and that I paid money for, but now I'm defaulting back to SD cards. Now I need to probably dive into the menu a bit more, but I got this warning with the uh, exclamation mark and a red circle around it. That's probably again related to the SD card. Thirdly, there is a, uh, a, a sizable delay um, between, and sometimes there's some stuttering. So this is lagging again. This is fine. This is lagging. Dang, that took a minute to stop recording. So like if I record for a few seconds and then stop it and record again, there's this massive lag and the, and the image starts to stutter um, and then eventually it catches up, but then you're just like unsure. So it's hard to be, this, this sometimes is unreliable of how to look at an image. Now, luckily the back uh, image here on your LCD, it doesn't go away. So you can still see in real time what your camera is seeing. So maybe just again, over time, the next firmware update, stability and um, the lack of lagging and stuff like that will be corrected. Uh, so definitely want to bring that to your attention. Okay, so now here's the moment of truth. Is it worth getting the Video Assist 12G for your X-H2S or any other camera that records B-Roll? Well, actually, I can only speak to this camera that records B-Roll. B-Roll. Uh, and my answer is... No, it's not worth it just yet. I think it's close. Um, the image, I do like what the image is doing. Um, the workflow is similar, is not the same as having internal B-roll. Uh, some things I pointed out, like not being able to change ISO, what a forever reason that is. Um, but I think the cons outweigh the pros for my personal use. You might have noticed some digital static colored noise. Um, that was kind of just like just pop up here and there or the lagging um, of the image from time to time now it was hard to predict when and when that when and where that would happen some cases has some very clean imagery and some beautiful imagery in other cases I was kind of battling the system that is the monitor and the camera so hopefully Fujifilm and Blackmagic don't make this sort of like a one-off update hopefully they make other updates to improve the relationship between the monitor and the camera for those who really want to test this out and try it out for themselves. Now, I don't see myself using the X-H2S as a B camera to my Blackmagic Pocket. That was never the intention. But the fact that you have that opportunity, like I said, that is a benefit. You can you can use this camera to insert if needed to. So I have that opportunity if I need to. But yeah, that's how I feel. Let me know how you feel. And I'll catch you guys in the next video, which will be coming around quite soon. All right. See you.